For blood test number five in 2023, when using Dr. Morgan Levine's biological age calculator, PhenoAge, we saw what looks like an outlier, especially when compared against the last eight tests, as this test was about five years worse than that previous eight test average. Moreover, it's been about 20 tests since I had a data point that was as bad as this test going back to 2020. So with that in mind, what's contributing to these data? So first, let's take a look at supplements that corresponded to this dietary period for blood test number five. So if you're familiar with the channel, I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my 20s, so I've been taking levothyroxine, 137.5 micrograms per day since then. I've, I also supplement with vitamin D, 1,000 IUs per day in most of the, for most of the year in Boston. For this test, for 19 of the 47 days that correspond to this test, I supplemented with vitamin D. Now, more specifically for that 47-day period, it started on July 5th, so that's immediately after blood test number four, and it lasted until August 20th, the day before blood test number five. So for that 47-day period, I'm going to show averages for dietary data and supplements in this video. All right, so for the first 19 days of that dietary period, I supplemented with niacin and tryptophan to potentially impact NAD. 828 milligrams per day of niacin, 737 milligrams per day for tryptophan. And that didn't raise, didn't further raise NAD relative to niacin alone. And if you missed that video, it'll be in the right corner. But then I tried uh, tryptophan alone, taking niacin out for 28 days before the test. I only supplemented with tryptophan two grams per day and no supplemental niacin. And I'll have an update video on that coming relatively soon in terms of whether or not it uh, affected NAD. Now, my tryptophan intake from food is about one gram per day on 100 grams of protein per day, and that data is generated by chronometer. So this additional two grams of tryptophan per day brings my total to three, which is about a 300% increase relative to my baseline. In other words, that's a super physiological dose. Could that have negatively impacted my blood biomarkers, thereby resulting in a worse biological age score? Now, I also supplemented with serine, the amino acid serine, and vitamin B6, or pyridoxal 5-phosphate, P5P. For, for this test, for that 47-day period, it was 5.7 grams of serine per day and about 26 milligrams of vitamin B6 per day. And I used that combination to potentially reduce homocysteine. Again, I'll have an update on that coming soon. Update video for that coming soon. Now, my dietary serine intake is 3.8 grams per day. Again, data generated by a chronometer. So with supplementation, adding that 5.7 grams per day brings me to, or brought me to 9.5 grams of serine per day, which is a 2.5 fold increase above baseline. In other words, a 250% increase above my normal non-supplemented intake for serine. So that raises the question, did too much supplemental tryptophan and or serine mess up blood biomarkers for this test? Especially when considering that my data is not generally very variable. This is this data is looks like an outlier. So why trying to get towards why that could be the case so I can learn from it and potentially minimize this occurrence going forward? That's the goal. So to address that, we'll need to take a look at diet and more specifically what diet composition corresponds to this test. And that's what we'll see here. Average daily dietary intake for that 47-day period that corresponds to test number five with the first 25 foods listed here. So I rank them in order, so, so from one to 25 in terms of grams, with the exception of green tea at number 22, which is in ounces. But then what's different test over test? So for that, we'll pull up test number four and note that test number four has a 70, 72 day period in between blood tests. So test number three was on April 23rd, 24th, test number four was on July 5th. So there's 72 days in between blood tests. And then we can compare with a two sample T test the 40 intake for the 47 days versus the 72 days to see what might be different test over test. So when doing that, first we can see that watermelon intake was significantly different, test number five versus test number four. But note that that's only a two gram difference higher for test number five, resulting in a 1% difference, statistically sig significant test over test. But this is a minor change relative to the 250 to 300% increase for serine and uh, or tryptophan. I also increased almond intake by about three grams, which is a 14% increased level of almonds in test five versus test number four. And I did that to try to impact DHEA sulfate, and I'll have a little bit more on that later. I also increased flaxseed intake to get more alpha-linolenic acid, ALA. Uh, so 
uh, ALA has been shown to activate PPAR alpha, which may impact NAD. So for the close to the end of the test, that increased flaxseed intake, which is why we can see that it was significantly higher test over test. But note, even with that small increase, it's still only 21% higher. Again, not within the magnitude of the differences for serine and tryptophan. And then I purposely reduced walnut intake following correlations with my dietary data for omega-6 with blood biomarkers, showing which shows suggests that too much omega-6 in my diet may be bad for more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. So I reduced walnut intake, but again, that's about a 21% reduction, still 15 times lower than the magnitude of the tryptophan increase. And again, these are minor changes relative to the amino acid supplementation for serine and tryptophan. So this is the first half of the diet. What about the other half? Now we can see the other 25 foods as shown here, and again, ranked in grams. But we wanna know what's different test over test, so let's take a look at test number four's foods for 26 that were ranked 26 to 50 for that test. And then in terms of what's different test over test, Brazil nuts are right at that border of statistical significance with that p-value of 0.05, but note that that's a 0.1 gram difference, 7.4 versus 7.3 grams. Again, a very minor dietary difference test over test. I also included jalapenos, for test number five versus test number four didn't have any. So that's only one, about one gram per day. Very minor uh, dietary difference, test over test. And then there were foods that were only for test number four or only for test number five. First, grapeseed powder was only found in test number four as I was trying to impact NAD levels and that didn't work. That video will be in the right corner if you missed it. I also had peanut butter as a part of my cheat meal for that dietary period. Peanut butter was not in test number five, but in contrast, I included cashew butter as a part of two cheat meals, but more on that in a second. So you can see that so far, there are minor dietary differences at most around 20%, still nothing within that magnitude of 250 or 300% increased as we see for, or saw for serine or tryptophan. And we can see that difference for serine, just look at, looking at test over test, 5.7 grams versus 4.1 grams. So even just looking at the 1.6 gram increase, that alone is a 40, about a 40% increase, more than for any food, either higher or lower. And similarly, tryptophan at 1.1 grams, and note that I didn't have tryptophan for a, a, a small period during that 47 day period, but again, exactly two grams for the 28 days before this test, it, it wasn't included in test number four, and that's why we see that the p-value is less than 0 0.05. Now, my diet is not always clean, I do include cheat meals. I find that if it's always clean, if I try to ha have it always clean and no cheat meals, that can lead to a binge and I'm trying to avoid those as much as possible as too many calories may be the worst thing for blood biomarkers. So for this test on those two separate days, it included cashew butter mixed with M&Ms on one day and then cashew butter, about 100 grams mixed with Reese's peanut butter cup on the other day. Now, when calculating the sum of the calories from M&Ms and peanut butter cup, that's 834 calories, which is less than 1% of all calories for this 47-day period. In other words, the diet is usually around 99% clean with just a little bit of junk. Now, this li list is ranked in grams. Which foods are top contributors for calories? And that's what we'll see here. So starting it off, note that these data are tracked by chronometer, and if you want to track your own data, there'll be a discount link in the video's description to use chronometer. Now, in terms of average daily calorie intake, that was 2122 per day. And if you're familiar with the channel, I've been saying that for many tests going back to 2020, as I've been purposely cutting my calories by just a small amount for a very long period of time with the goal of getting lean and staying lean, not, not reverting back to higher body weights. So this is my lowest average daily calorie intake since I started tracking diet in April of 2015 with blood test number four's average 2145 being the previous low. So in terms of the top contributor for calories, once again, it's sardines. And then without going through everything on the list, note that nine of these top 10 foods for my calorie intake were the same as for test number four. So no major differences in terms of where I'm getting my calories from test over test, which could implicate serine and tryptophan once again as the potential uh, factors that negatively impacted this blood test data. All right, so what about macronutrients? We've gone through calories. How about protein, carbs, and fat? So starting with average daily protein intake, it was about 101 grams per day, 19% of total calories. And for test number four, that average was about 99 grams. So when using a two sample t-test for the 47 day period for test number five and the 72 day period for test number four, these differences were not significant. So protein intake was similar test over test. You can see the p-value is 0 
When it's less than 0.05, that's statistically significant, at least nominally, without adjusting for multiple comparisons. All right, so some have asked where I'm getting 100 grams of protein from, so I decided to include that for this video. So which foods contributed to protein intake? And that's what we can see here. It shouldn't be a surprise that the top contributor is sardines, as they're the top contributor for calories. And then I get a good amount of protein from collard greens, from yogurt. You can see serine contributed about 6 grams per day. Almonds, mushrooms, flax seeds, beets, steel cut oats, and carrots. All right, so what about fat intake? How does that compare test over test? And that's what we'll start off with here for test number five. So we can see that the average daily fat intake was about 81 grams per day, 34.5% of total calories. But again, how does this compare with test number four if we're going to see if diet was different test over test to potentially implicate serine and or tryptophan as the con confounding factors for this blood, these blood test results? And that's what we can see here. So daily, daily, average daily fat intake for test number four, where fat intake, average daily fat intake, about 80 grams per day, 33.6% of total calories, and rather than, rather than just looking at averages, we can see that based on the p-value, although it's relatively close, they're not statistically different. So 81 grams versus 80 grams, no difference basically for fat intake test over test. Uh, in investigating further, fat isn't just one homogeneous type of fat. There's monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, trans fats, etc. So how does that compare? So we can see that monounsaturated fat was about 2 grams higher for this test and significantly higher. But note that again, two grams higher on the backdrop of test four, test number four, 18 grams, that's an 11% difference. Still not within that ballpark of what was, what, what, what was higher for serine and tryptophan. And then going, we can see that omega-3 was higher for this test as I purposefully increased it towards the end of the test, getting more flaxseed with the goal of increase any, or, or potentially increasing NAD through PPAR alpha activation. And again, update video on that coming relatively soon. And that was a significant difference, so significantly higher omega-3. But to reiterate, that's less than one gram on the backdrop of test number four is nine grams. You know, that's, again, 11% different, different. That's not a 250 or 300% difference. Very minor difference. And then we can see that omega-3 was less by less than one gram again. So this is a less than 5% difference, although it's significant test over test. Minor dietary difference. And then... Uh, so total uh, polyunsaturated fats were not different, test over test, neither were saturated fats, and I don't track trans fat because I basically don't eat any. C total cholesterol, dietary cholesterol, wasn't different, test over test either. So once again, we can see that there are relatively small dietary fat changes, test over test. So, to, so note that although there are some changes, I do intend to try to bring total fat back to 80 grams, omega-6 back to 16 grams, but I'm going to have omega-3 go higher as I'm trying to increase NAD through more omega-3. But this time, I'm not going to use flaxseed, which is a source of ALA. I'm going to use EPA and DHA. So expect to see that omega-3 higher than 10 grams per day. But I am going to go to 9.2 grams per day with sardines and flax. So anyway, the point here is I'm going to get it to about 11 something grams per day with an additional two grams coming from omega-3. Hopefully that doesn't mess up whatever tryptophan and serine messed up, so stay tuned for that in an upcoming video. All right, next up is carb intake. So first, test number five, and then test number four. Total carbs, 286 for test number five, which seems like a lot, but remember, net carbs equals total carbs minus fiber. Average daily fiber intake was 83.5 grams per day, and when subtracting that from total carbs, gives a net carbs of 203 grams per day. We're compared with test number four, that's significantly lower for test number five. But again, that eight gram difference on the backdrop of 200 and about 12 grams is again, less than 5% difference, a my, minor dietary change, test over test. Also, I track total fructose intake as I uh, tend to eat a lot of fruit and vegetables on, these, on this diet. We can see that total fructose for this test was 58 and a half grams per day. And for test number four, it was 58.1 grams per day, not significantly different test over test. And then although fiber was on the border of significance or close to significance, 0.08 is close to 0.05 for a p-value, that's still about a two, two gram difference on the backdrop of 86 grams. I mean, again, that's a less than 5% difference, uh, even if it was statistically significant, which it's not, but it's a less than 5% difference test over test. These dietary differences don't come close to the magnitude that I was able to impact with supplements for tryptophan and serine. All right, what about vitamin or mineral intake? Could those factors have impacted the, uh, my blood test data for test number five? So total vitamin intake, and it may be hard to see, so if you haven't gone full screen already, I'd recommend doing that. 
vitamin intake test number five and test number four. So just highlighting what was different, we can see that niacin was significantly higher for test number five versus test number four, but this is a little bit misleading because as I mentioned, I did supplement with niacin for the first 19 days of this test, but for the remaining uh, 28 days, there was no niacin. And I find it hard to believe that four weeks of no niacin or the first 19 days of niacin are going to affect the test four weeks later. I find that hard to believe, but nonetheless, it's a potential factor. Similarly, uh, vitamin B6 was significantly lower by about 10 milligrams per day, but note that both of these are still ab above my baseline of three, gram three milligrams per day. I find it hard to believe that B6 impact negatively impacted my data because B6 has been at least eight times higher than my baseline for the last two tests. So it's been in the ballpark. I find it hard to believe that would be a contributing factor to the uh, potential outlier data for blood test number five. And then vitamin D was significantly lower, test five versus test number four. But I account for that by getting sun exposure uh, in Boston as much as I can whenever there's sun, full body sun exposure. So I doubt that uh, this reduction of about 600 IUs per day uh, made a dent as, as again, I'm getting full body sun exposure. Vitamin D was significantly different, but again, that's a 0.5 milligram increase test over test. And I did that on purpose because in my data, I was trying to get a boost for DHEA sulfate as vitamin E was one of the, uh, is one of the dietary variables that has the strongest correlation with DHEA sulfate in my data. Uh, so I tried to increase it by a little bit. So that's where you get the additional 0.5 milligrams per day. But none, nonetheless, that's still a less than 3% difference test over test. I find, again, and I know I'm repeating myself, I find it very hard to believe that minor dietary difference would have affected the overall blood biomarker profile. All right, so that's it for vitamins. Nothing else was significantly different test over test. What about minerals? And that's what we can see here, test number five minerals, test number four mineral intake. And here, for each of these minerals that are shown, the p-value was greater than 0.05 for all comparisons. In other words, mineral intake was not different when comparing test five versus test number four. So cumulative, clu, sorry, cumulatively, when looking at macros, micros, and in individual dietary intake in terms of foods, we can see that there were minor changes, at most around 20% different, whereas the differences for serine, serine and tryptophan, if I haven't hammered that home by now, were 250 to 300% higher than my baseline. So I think those are the most likely factors. And correspondingly, for the next test, which I've scheduled for sometime in October, I've taken out tryptophan, I've taken out serine, and I've taken out vitamin B6. So if those were negatively impacting this most recent blood test, we'd expect that my data should go back to those uh, further reductions for biological age for test number six. But also for the next test, I've added omega-3, two grams per day, and methyl B12 as a means for reducing homocysteine. Hopefully it won't mess up other biomarkers, but stay tuned for that data in a future video. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be interested in, including discount links for at-home metabolomics, NAD quantification, epigenetic and telomere testing, oral microbiome composition, green tea, at-home blood testing with SciFox Health, and note that their panel is different from the at-home metabolomics. It includes ApoB, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.